Marvin Goodfriend, critical of the Fed, critical of Congress at Carnegie Mellon University. Professor, uh, good noon to you. Hi, nice to be here, Tom. If you were at the Eccles Building today in the FOMC meeting, what would you be listening for? Well, I think the Fed's under pressure because of the poor, poorly executed fiscal policy. There's going to be um, increasing pressure on the Fed to do something, precisely because the Fed is independent, an independent central bank. Uh, but what I would be arguing at the table would be that that pressure, pressure should be resisted uh, because it's not the right time to do anything else. We need to let things settle out. Um, and, and the worst thing that could happen is if the Fed, in my view, let uh, beliefs um, take root that it might be willing to do more QE right. in a way that the inflation rate is rising. That could, be, that could let the inflation genie out of the bag, and we don't want to do that at this point. At the Richmond Fed, folks, the House of Lacquer, there is a photograph of young Marvin Goodfriend when he worked at the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, and there is not a single gray hair on his head. Let's go to the Fed Reserve balance sheet here, and the title of it, Marvin, is Goodfriend Grays. Uh, this is amazing. We've expanded our balance sheet once and now twice. If we were to have QE3, given low real and nominal GDP, given stagnant jobs, if we did that, would the balance sheet increase even further? Oh, no question. QE is all about creating money in the, f in the form of bank reserves in order to buy treasury securities, and that would blow up the balance sheet further. In fact, if QE would have any effect at all, it would have to do so on a scale even greater than it, than it was used in QE2. What is the economics behind this? We look at that chart and we're all nervous in our dumb way, but tell us right now the Fed's independence in their economics. Are they using the same models and the same templates that they used pre-crisis? Gosh, I, I, I can only guess at that because I've, I've been out of the Fed now for three years, but uh, my guess is that they're willing to entertain all kinds of off, off, you know, out of the box ideas given what's happened. Uh, and, and there's probably a lot of free thinking in the Fed at this point, what to do, what if, and various what if scenarios. We're really in uncharted territory as we speak because, you know, we've had three years of stagnation. Um, the fiscal policy has been expended. The monetary policy has been expended in an expansionary way. There really aren't many bullets left to, to shoot. And, um, you know, it's hard to say what, what the, the nature, the tenor right. of the conversation is on, in, on the inside. This is my single best chart of the world. Let's bring it up. We introduced it yesterday from Carla Cottarelli in the IMF. All you need to know, folks, is over on the left side is austerity. Over on the right side uh, is less austerity. The U.S. and Japan way over on the right side. Marvin Goodfriend, does the U.S. have to migrate to the left to be like Greece, the United Kingdom, and Spain? Do we need a sooner austerity, or can we wait, as so many opposing you would suggest? Well, my, my feeling is we need to discipline fiscal policy. We have arrived at a situation, and the way I would describe it is, is this. People, there are two sorts of perspectives on fiscal policy of the U.S. government. One is uh, on the recipient side, people counting on entitlements on all sorts of government spending to help them out. The other side are people who identify more closely as taxpayers. And they're concerned about having taxes increased to help pay for the recipients. What we've managed to do is put ourselves in the United States in the worst of all possible world, worlds. Both sides of this debate are nervous about their own circumstances in the future. And so the recipients are cutting back on spending, not knowing whether they're going to continue to get entitlements. Right. And the taxpayers are cutting back on spending, not knowing whether they're going to be taxed. We've got to get out of the middle ground. We're kind of in the middle of a river, if you want, a metaphor, uh, in the deep water. We've got to get back to one of the sides. Uh, I have a preference Professor Goodfriend, coming across the Bloomberg, Secretary Geithner speaking with the Chinese. We'll have those headlines up here in a bit if you haven't already seen them. There seems to be an international dialogue. Here's the laureate Michael Spence. Let's bring up this op-ed. Folks, if you want to read one op-ed in the past 48 hours, this is it. Michael Spence of NYU, stagnant and paralyzed, too many countries seem to be focused more on political outcomes than on economic performance. Markets are simply holding up a mirror to these flaws and risks. The Chinese and others, Professor Goodfriend, have to be looking at the cacophony of U.S. policy and saying, what next? What should Chairman Bernanke say today to assuage the international criticism? Well, the, what the Fed ought to do and what Ben Bernanke ought to do as chairman of the Fed is to come out of the box and re restate the Fed's commitment to price stability. 
That's the job the Fed can perform. It's the one thing that QE can be counted upon to perform. And the Fed ought to reiterate its intention to maintain some degree of price stability. We don't want deflation for sure, but we also don't want inflation. And we don't want the markets to believe that the Fed will inflate the economy, because that will drive up longer term interest rates and put fiscal pressure even greater on the US government. That, that would be my right. main message. Uh, Marvin, if we look at the personal story here of so many Americans, it is a national anxiety, a word Paul Krugman, among others, is used. We look at personal disposable income, inflation adjusted going flat. You and others have advocated growth strategies. How distant are we from an intelligent, long-term strategy as we're just trying to get out of the immediate crisis? We're, we're, I would say we're pretty, pretty far from it. I mean, the, the, the way we get out of this crisis with price stability in a way that, that allows the economy to grow in the future is to, is to fix the fiscal policy so that recipients and taxpayers alike can count on some certainty in future uh, um, uh, commitments. And so then, in particular, those families, those firms with the wherewithal and the means to spend will begin to spend again, which will put people back to work. And also those people in a position to make investments mm -hmm. will be in a position to take those risks knowing that they won't be taxed unfairly or at high marginal tax rates for the privilege of having taken those risks. Very good. Professor, well, we're going to have to leave it there, Professor Goodfriend.